Hi everyone, today we're talking about metamorphic petrology. And in today's video specifically, we'll be going over an introduction to metamorphic petrology and all that it encompasses, including different types of metamorphism, including but not limited to regional and contact, different types of metamorphic rocks, their metamorphic grade, their protolis, their textures, and all of that. So let's get started. First, what is metamorphism? Metamorphism in geology is the recrystallization of a rock under high temperature and pressure. And I say and or pressure here just because different types of metamorphism have different amounts of pressure and temperature that are acting on the rock to metamorphose it. For example, contact metamorphism is really more heat than it is pressure that metamorphoses the rock. And regional metamorphism is more so heat and pressure that is causing the metamorphism of that rock. At low temperature, however, the line between metamorphism and diagenesis can become a little fuzzy, but we can at least partially distinguish these two processes based on the participation of clastic grains in reactions with pore water in the pore spaces of those clastic grains, as well as the precipitates that might be precipitating from that water. What does that mean? Well, clastic or detrital sediment grains that are accumulating and becoming buried in a sedimentary environment or basin are typically surrounded by water in an aquatic environment where water infiltrates pore spaces and becomes pore water. And then reactions might occur that cause the precipitation of cement in between those grains. And that whole process causes the lithification or rock formation of those grains and turns them into rocks. But this is all sedimentary. When it comes to metamorphic rocks, you have to get a little further down in the burial to really get the high enough temperatures and pressures to cause the actual clastic grains in between the cement or pore water to react with that cement and pore water. And once they start to react and participate in those reactions, that is then termed metamorphism. But that line is not super clear. So sometimes when you're right on the brink of it, you'll see some overlap there. On the other spectrum, at high temperatures rather than low temperatures, melts can be generated from rock material that makes the line between metamorphism and igneous processes a little bit fuzzy. But we can also define this line. For example, the melt that forms at these high temperatures cools or crystallizes to form true igneous rocks, whereas the residue that didn't fully melt is metamorphic. Metamorphic rocks, however, can form in a variety of environments under a variety of conditions. There are many types of metamorphic for example, we have regional and contact, which are probably the most commonly taught types of metamorphism. Regional metamorphism is obviously on a regional scale where subduction zones or any plate boundaries, for example, are causing high temperatures and pressures of rocks that are being buried and crushed underneath those plate boundaries and deformed but not fully melted. And those rocks that are becoming deformed in these high temperature pressure environments on a regional scale are are doing so by way of regional metamorphism. Whereas contact metamorphism is when intrusions of magma chambers, for example, or plutons come up and come into contact with country rock, which that heat caused by that intrusion then metamorphoses right at that fuzzy contact shown in this figure between the intrusion and the country rock. And this contact metamorphism is typically dominated by by heating rather than pressure. So we're not going to see the same textures as we would in the rocks that were regionally metamorphosed because those had high pressures to orient the mineral grains in a certain fashion, whereas the contact metamorphism is heating, not necessarily pressure, so it's not going to have as much orienting of grains. And we'll see that when we get to the metamorphic textures part of this video. But there are many other types of metamorphism other than regional and contact, which include big Burial, for example, in which the deep burial of sediments can cause high temperature and pressures and therefore metamorphism, just like we talked about when it comes to the line between diagenesis and metamorphism. We'll see this in a couple slides when we talk about whether coal is an example of a metamorphic rock because it really depends.
depends on the level of burial diagenesis or burial metamorphism that occurred. We also have here dynamic metamorphism in which shear zones, which are contacts between rocks that are sliding against each other, cause pressure and temperature enough to deform those rocks in that zone and cause them to gain metamorphic characteristics and therefore is metamorphism. We also have hydrothermal metamorphism up at the right corner here, which is caused by the convection of really hot hydrothermal fluid water through that upper oceanic newly formed crust water that convects through those newly formed igneous minerals like feldspars and peroxides and amphiboles to react with them and transform them into micas and clays. And down here we have impact metamorphism, which is pretty self-explanatory from its name, but it is the metamorphism caused by the really, really high temperatures and pressures upon impact of a meteorite. And obviously this is a really localized type of metamorphism, but causes some really, really specific and diagnostic characteristic metamorphic textures. So now that we've talked about what metamorphism is, as well as what types of metamorphism there are, what is the goal of metamorphic petrology? Well, we have three major goals when studying metamorphic petrology. The first is to determine the protolith of the metamorphic rock, that is, the original rock before it became metamorphosed. And if we determine it to be igneous or sedimentary, then what kind of igneous or sedimentary rock? Can we draw any more conclusions other than just it being igneous or sedimentary? And can that tell us about maybe what kind of environment it underwent metamorphism in, and maybe about the type of metamorphism it underwent? For example, our next goal of studying metamorphic petrology is to determine the conditions of the metamorphism. And these are things like the temperature and pressure of the rock crystallized at, the composition of the fluid present during metamorphism, because maybe that caused compositional changes to the protolith that caused it to become the metamorphic rock it is at that point? And did the rock change composition during metamorphism, which is basically what I just said? Did any fluids alter it? Did it change composition purely because the higher temperatures and pressures caused it to? There are a lot of things to consider when looking at metamorphic rocks. And the last major goal is determining the structural history rather than just the compositional history. So was the rock structurally deformed? Did it deform before, during, or after? metamorphism and basically overall what can that tell us about the history of the rock. So let's start with protolith. How do we determine a metamorphic rock's protolith? Well in many cases it's somewhat simple. For example, marble is the metamorphic rock that forms when limestone undergoes metamorphism. And how do we know this? Well marble's composition is completely calcitic. It's made of calcite. It's just that the calcite grains have become deformed and recrystallized to form a really hard version of calcite. And limestone starts as also being the composition of calcite, calcium carbonate. So we know marble's protolith because of its composition. Likewise, quartzite typically has a sandstone protolith. Why? Well, quartzite's composition, obviously from its name, is dominated by quartz, and quartz grains are really common in sandstone. Many sandstones are dominated by quartz, and when sandstones undergo metamorphism, the quartz grains typically dominate the recrystallization fabric and become this really hard rock called quartzite. You'll see a common theme here when we talk about metamorphic rocks, and that is they are harder than their sedimentary protolith, and that's because they're becoming so densely packed and recrystallized under pressure. And and that causes them to be much harder. And if you don't know what mineral hardness is to begin with, you can check out this video up here linked to the top right. I talk about mineral hardness in there and the Mohs hardness scale if you want to know the difference between the hardness of different minerals. Another compositionally similar rock to its protolith is gneiss. Gneiss is a high-grade metamorphic rock, meaning it underwent very high temperatures and pressures to become metamorphic, that is typically the metamorphic version of granite. Granite contains mostly quartz and feldspar and sometimes amphiboles, peroxines, and micas. And gneiss contains typically the same things and becomes banded because of this compositional variation. However, as we'll see later, gneiss is not so simple and there are a few other ways or protoliths in which metamorphism can cause this type of metamorphic banding. Another example of metamorphic rock that is pretty easy to tell its protolith is schist 
schist and slate. Schist is the high-grade metamorphic rock to shale, and slate is the low-grade metamorphic rock to shale. Shale is the protolith for both. When only undergoing relatively low temperature and pressure metamorphism, shale becomes slate, and when undergoing high temperature and pressure metamorphism, shale becomes schist, or slate becomes schist after it's already been metamorphosed in low-grade metamorphism. You might think that the schist looks very shiny and very different than boring old shale or clay, but this schist is shiny because of all the mica minerals that it contains, like muscovite, for example example. And these mica minerals form from their original protolith clay minerals. And so it's pretty easily recognizable to say that the protolith to schist was some sort of clay mineral dominated rock. Basalt is a little bit more difficult. Basalt can be very many different compositions. So saying that basalt is the protolith to blank metamorphic rock is very difficult because there's a lot of different types of basalt. And so it has composition variety, it has structural variety, it has a lot of variety that makes its final metamorphic equivalent hard to determine. But a couple examples that we'll talk more later in the video about are green schist and eclogite, which are two types of metamorphic rock that can result from different types of basalt. But it depends on both the original composition of the basalt and the metamorphic grade of the metamorphism. So if it's high grade, it'll be different than if it's low grade, etc. The last example I show here is coal. So remember how we said coal is kind of on that fuzzy line between diagenesis and metamorphism. Metamorphism. That is because coal forms by burial metamorphism, and it's low grade at that, so relatively low temp and pressure for metamorphism. And what we see is that bitumous coal, which technically is still sedimentary, can metamorphose by low grade burial metamorphism into anthracite coal. And so anthracite can sometimes technically be classified as metamorphic um, because it's just past that fuzzy line of diagenesis to metamorphism. But again, when we're determining protolith, anthracite is pretty simple. Obviously, it's protolith, it's coal. We know that because it's coal. <laughs> But what can we tell using the textures of metamorphic rocks? Yes, we can look at the compositions, but until we really observe the textures in that metamorphic rock, we can't tell much more about its structural history and about the metamorphic environment that it formed in without looking at the textures. Primary textures of rocks form during deposition of sedimentary rocks or during crystallization of igneous rocks. And these can sometimes be saved in metamorphic rocks if it was relatively low grade metamorphism or the original rock was relatively sturdy and preserved some of that primary texture during the metamorphism. However, metamorphic textures are more so secondary and can be classified as either static textures or tectonic textures. These are exactly what they sound like. Static texture refers to minerals that grew or recrystallized without deformation or after deformation and therefore aren't smushed or oriented in any regular pattern, whereas tectonic textures are those that grew or recrystallized during or before deformation and therefore are smushed or foliated or some sort of pressure texture is observed in tectonic textures or tectonically deformed metamorphic rocks. So first let's talk about primary textures and what might be preserved in metamorphic rocks and then we'll talk about the secondary metamorphic textures that are added on to that and what we can glean from both of those types of textures. So sedimentary types of primary textures are things like bedding and sometimes bedding can manifest as compositional layering in metamorphic metamorphic rocks, as we can see on the right here. But like we talked about, this nice banding or compositional banding can also be due to a granite protolith. So how do we tell between whether the nice layering or banding is due to a stratified sandstone, for example, or a granite? In general, thin quartzose, calcareous, or politic layers, politic is muddy or clayey, indicates a sedimentary protolith. 
However, many sedimentary textures are obliterated during metamorphism. So if it is low-grade metamorphism, maybe they're still somewhat preserved. But if it's high-grade and you can tell that, then it's probably not sedimentary textures that you're looking at. It might be leftover igneous textures, but it's probably more likely secondary metamorphic or deformation textures. Oh, and here's an example of nice banding just to get a contrast there. But moving on to igneous primary textures, the most distinguishing relic igneous texture is probably tabular feldspar. So tabular plagioclase or K feldspar indicates an orthonice or an igneous protolith gneiss over paranice or a sedimentary protolith gneiss. Some other types of igneous primary textures that might be preserved in metamorphic rocks include pillow basalts. So pillow basalts often are metamorphosed by alteration or hydrothermal metamorphism, like we saw in the hydrothermal vent environment that the water altered the material surrounding that vent. And pillow basalts sometimes have these rims of alteration that we can see on their outer surfaces. And in these pillow basalts, they still maintained their igneous primary texture of being pillow basalts. But another type of igneous relic texture is vesicles. So vesicles form at the tops of lava flows typically, and sometimes these vesicles during metamorphism aren't completely obliterated, and instead they're filled with minerals like zeolite, calcite, epitote, or prehnite. So if you see vesicles that are filled with little white minerals like this, sometimes that's an igneous relic texture that there were vesicles in the parent rock or protolith, and that indicates an igneous protolith. Although many times if pressure is involved in the metamorphism, those vesicles aren't preserved. So what is most often preserved in metamorphic rocks? Well, not the primary textures. It's typically the metamorphic textures or the secondary textures caused by metamorphism because metamorphism often obliterates a lot of the primary textures. So what are these metamorphic textures or static and tectonic textures and how can we recognize them? Well, like I mentioned, static textures are textures caused by minerals that grow without deformation or after deformation. And some terms we'll talk about are ideoblastic and granoblastic, whereas tectonic textures are those that show that the minerals obviously were deformed after they grew. And we can see foliation, schistosity, and lineation, as well as nisosity, which we kind of just talked about. It's like nisic banding. So we can see those in the pressure involved or tectonic textures. But we'll start with the static textures. So static metamorphic textures are those that arise from high temperature metamorphism, but probably weren't put under as high of pressure in their metamorphic environment. For example, something like contact metamorphism could have caused them. And in static textures, grains are typically equant or equal in size. Another term for this is equigranular. We can see this over here to the right. And also they have dihedral angles or angles at which their grain boundaries meet that are are around 120 degrees. So we can see a lot of the grain boundaries here have angles of 120 degrees, and that is very typical of static metamorphic textures. And when euhedral crystals are present, crystals with well-defined crystal faces, the texture is called ideoblastic. However, sometimes coarse-grained crystals in metamorphic rocks can be present amongst a finer-grained matrix of metamorphic minerals, and these are called porphyroblasts. And these can include things like garnet, starlight, or aluminosilicates. Granoblastic textures, as opposed to ideoblastic textures result from crystallization that occurs after deformation. One type of granoblastic texture is exhibited in the fine-grained rock hornfells, and the intergrown crystal network of hornfells and other granoblastic rocks often cause them to break conchoidally. And we'll talk more about this in the classification slide at the end. Tectonic metamorphic textures, on the other hand, develop a crystallographic preferred orientation.
application. However, there are different terms for different planar features, and we'll talk about these terms now. So foliation is one example where it basically applies to anything that is a planar feature in the rock. Schistosity, on the other hand, are planar features defined by preferred orientation of platy or tabular minerals. Lineation, on the other hand, describes linear rather than planar features. So a line is a line, a plane is a plane, and linear features that formed by preferential orientation of tabular minerals or by intersection of foliation planes. So we can see that this figure C example has lineation and foliation, but no schistosity because those minerals are aligned linearly because they're tabular, they're not platy, whereas this figure D has all three, foliation, cystosity, and lineation. We can see the linear tabular minerals are aligned, and then we have the platy minerals that are a parallel to bedding orientation, and then we have the foliation in the center. So all three are present in figure D, and they're all slightly different from one another. Lastly, getting into classification. So metamorphic classification can be done using structural classification or structural terms, or by compositional terms. So first let's talk about the structural terminology or structural classification of metamorphic rocks. Then on the next slide, we'll talk about compositional classification. And sometimes both of these types of terms can be used to describe a metamorphic rock. So first we have granophiles here, which is a coarse equigranular rock. However, if you are taking metamorphic petrology, I'll let you in on a secret here. We never once had to identify granophiles, so I'm not sure how important it is to you. But we did talk a little bit more about hornfells, which is a much finer grained, massive, conchoidally breaking rock, which means it breaks with conchoidal fracture, kind of like glass or obsidian, rather than along any defined crystallographic planes. Slate, on the other hand, is a very fine grained rock that does break along defined crystallographic or cleavage planes. It's very similar to its protolith of shale in that it's platy and has these cleavage planes, but it's much harder than shale itself. Phyllite is another very fine grained rock, but it has a silky luster as well as on its cleavage planes, which distinguishes it from slate because yes, it has cleavage, but it's got the silky luster. It also, in my opinion, is not as platy as slate. So if you're trying to distinguish between the two, it's more of a, um, it's platy, but thinner, thinner plates in, in, in hand samples. It's hard to show without like holding one. Um, schist is another thing that I think a lot of people sometimes think is hard to distinguish from phyllite. But until I actually held a true phyllite, I agreed with this. Now I think it's relatively easy. If you hold it and look at a phyllite, it's much less schistose. If you hold a schist, it's getting like kind of flake off. Whereas if you hold a phyllite, it's not as flaky. It's not as micaceous. It's a bit more hard and held together. And what you know i've held this is only all in my experience lastly nice here is a lot different than all these other structures of metamorphic rocks and it's you know very hard it's not going to flake anything and it's got this banding it's just really easily recognizable it kind of just looks like a really banded granite but again these are just structural terms to get into the compositional metamorphic terms we have to talk about these names so here are metamorphic rock names that imply mineral assemblages rather than just structures. Green schist is the first one listed here, which is a foliated mafic metamorphic rock with actinolite as its major amphibole. The other thing here is green stone, which is a massive mafic metamorphic rock, which also has actinolite as its major amphibole. And the only difference here is that one is foliated, green schist, and one is massive. And obviously the schist term at the end here of the green schist is a bit more of a structural term, and that refers to its foliation or schistosity, whereas the massive rock is obviously not schist, it's stone because it doesn't have that foliation and schistosity that the green schist has. Amphibole light is another, I think is really easily recognized, and that is a metamorphic rock that is kind of like black and white polka dotted almost, that is mafic with horn blend as its major amphibole. So if you know amphiboles are just kind of like dark igneous minerals and amphibole light is kind of a mixture 
between, you know, it's got a lot of amphiboles, but it's also got some felsic material. And so it's got this white and black Dalmatian-y type of look with, of course, black being the dominant because amphiboles are dominating its fabric. And that's why it's called amphibolite. The next term here is blue schist. Blue schist is a mafic metamorphic rock with sodic amphibole as its major amph. So sodic amphiboles are typically, you know, things like glaucophane, which are blue in color, giving blue schist its name. And sodic just refers to these types of amphiboles being rich in sodium as opposed to other common cations in these igneous minerals. Granulite is a mafic metamorphic rock with orthoperoxine and clinoperoxine as its dominant minerals. Now, I'm going to let you in here on another secret from when I took metamorphic petrology, and that is I never had to identify granulite. I don't even really remember going over it, so I'm not sure how important it will be for you to know about. The next one is eclogite, which I love because it's not only easy to recognize, but also really freaking beautiful. And eclogite is a mafic metamorphic rock with clinoperoxine and garnet as its major minerals. And the clinoperoxine that it is dominated by is a green color, and it makes it this beautiful green with these beautiful red garnets in it. And so eclogite is just really recognizable with its green and its garnet porphyroblasts in it. And so it's just really recognizable and beautiful. And that's eclogite. Marble is the next one we already talked about. It's protolith being limestone, and it's typically fully calcite and or dolomite. And quartzite, we also talked about its protolith typically being sandstones or quartz rich sandstones. And quartzite is obviously, as its name suggests, dominated by quartz. And lastly, serpentine is an ultramafic metamorphic rock that is dominated by serpentine. So its major minerals name is the same as its rock name. And again, guys, what I remember most from metamorphic petrology is having to identify serpentine or sometimes called serpentinite, quartzite, marble, eclogite, amphibolite, and then structures like gneiss, schist, phyllite, and slate. So that is all I have for today's introductory metamorphic petrology video. And to make this video, I am using the essential of Igneous and Metamorphic Petrology by Ronald and Carol Frost. If you want to check out this book, it is linked in my description along with other minor and supporting references. And if you want to check out the other videos in this Metamorphic Petrology playlist, here's a couple upcoming videos in this playlist have listed here. Um, but obviously I haven't started them yet because they're just text here and they're not thumbnails yet. But, you know, maybe by the time you're watching this, they're already out. So if you want to see more about Metamorphic Petrology, you can click below in the rectangle below that says metamorphic astrology playlist and see if those videos are out and with that i will let you guys go thanks so much for watching and i'll see you guys next time bye